Rücken. Anybody who thought the news cycle would go back to normal or even within a million miles of normal after Joe Biden won the 2020 election was sadly mistaken. But even by post-insurrection standards, the onslaught of news over the last couple of weeks has been head spinning. And I'm only talking about what's been going on domestically. So to recap it in no particular order, uh, we have the fact that uh, after voting against $13.6 billion in aid to Ukraine, more than two dozen Senate Republicans have demanded that President Biden do more to help Ukraine. In primary elections held this month in Texas, the first after the state's latest round of voter suppression laws went into effect, the mail-in ballots of over 18,000 voters in the state's most populous counties were rejected, as evidence that these laws did exactly what they were intended to do Black voters were disproportionately likely to be disenfranchised. Then the New York Times editorial board revealed in a recent column that it doesn't understand what the First Amendment is or how it works. Republican Senator Mike Braun floated the idea that the right to interracial marriage should be left to the states, and Senator Marsha Blackburn suggested access to birth control was unconstitutional. After it became clear that Manhattan District Attorney Mark Alvin Bragg was not going to move forward with the case against Donald and the Trump Organization, it was revealed that Mark Pomerantz, one of the senior prosecutors who resigned as a result of Bragg's decisions, wrote in his resignation letter that he believed Donald is, quote, guilty of numerous felony violations and that failing to hold him accountable was a grave failure of justice, which seems like deja vu all over again, but we'll get to that later. Representative Mo Brooks of Alabama, participant in the January 6th insurrection and active seditionist, claimed that Donald asked him, quote, to rescind the 2020 elections, immediately remove Joe Biden from the White House, immediately put Donald back in the White House, and then hold a new special election for the presidency, which just shows you how little Donald actually knows about how this government works. It was reported that in the months between the election and the inauguration of Joe Biden, Jimmy, Jenny Thomas, wife of perjurer and illegitimate Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, exchanged 29 text messages with then Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. In one, she claimed the left is attempting the greatest heist of our history. Perhaps it's just a coincidence that Clarence Thomas was the lone dissent in the Supreme Court's rejection of Donald's bid to block the release of some presidential records to the January 6th committee. Your guess is as good as mine. It's also been reported that Ted Cruz, senator and also active seditionist, worked directly with Donald between Election Day and January 6th, and he was also deeply involved in helping craft a plan to keep Donald in power, which of course would have required overturning the results of a free and fair election, which Cruz proved he was completely willing to do. Then there's news that once again, Donald is soliciting the help of war criminal Vladimir Putin to get dirt on Joe Biden, the guy who pulverized him in the 2020 election. Donald's goal is to weaken Biden ahead of the 2024 election, but it's also to undermine our commander in chief at a terribly fraught time for our national security. A federal judge ruled that Donald vigorously campaigned for Pence to single-handedly determine the results of the 2020 election, which amounted to a coup in search of a legal theory. The illegality of the plan, the judge wrote, was obvious. And oh yeah, uh, there was a gap of seven and a half hours in Donald's White House call log on the day of the insurrection that he planned and incited. So what have the mainstream media been focusing on? What has risen above these blockbuster, potentially game-changing reports? Well, Biden said in the speech he gave in Poland, quote, for God's sakes, this man cannot remain in power. Biden, of course, was referring to Putin. And this statement is something any sane person would find unobjectionable. 
yet it was covered relentlessly. It was referred to as a gaffe, as a distraction, as undisciplined. Some in the press claimed that this, more than any of the other events I've mentioned, sent shockwaves around the world. And then yesterday, after hearing for a week that Ginny Thomas is a private citizen who was merely exercising her First Amendment rights, just as an aside, why does nobody seem to know what that means? After being told that regardless of her involvement in helping to orchestrate a coup, her poor husband should be left alone, there it was on the front page of the Washington Post. Above the fold, right next to reporting about the war in Ukraine, not one, but two stories about Hunter Biden. The one about his deals with the Chinese energy company was below the fold this afternoon, but almost getting as much attention as an article about the almost eight fucking hours missing from Donald's January 6th call logs. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest live stream of The Mary Trump Show. I cannot tell you how excited I am for tonight's guest. Uh, he is a comedian, actor, broadcast broadcaster, and according to his bio, Recovering Cynic, which I really want to know more about, uh, he hosts a show on Sirius XM, which we're also going to talk a lot about. And he is truly one of the best interviewers in the business. He's interviewed Almost everybody in some of my favorite interviews of his include Pete Townsend, Alan Rickman, David Crosby, Lily Tomlin, Stanley Tucci, and on and on and on. John Fugel saying, it is so phenomenal to have you here. Welcome. Mary, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, for letting me in and, and dragging your show down to my level. I'm really thrilled. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I, I appreciate how you're always willing to help out, so... Definitely I'm here to help. And I'm, I'm so glad you're doing this. I'm such a fan of you and what you do and how you use your voice and the way you use it to fight evil. And uh, I think you're a great broadcaster too. So thank oh, you. Awesome. Thank you. I, well, you know, I, I've been listening to your show shows and we'll talk about what that means later. But, uh, you know, you are, in addition to being an excellent interviewer, you are also um, a phenomenal ranter, uh, mm -hmm. which it's very important to me because there's kind of a lot to rant about now. And it always helps when people do that in a way that keeps perspective and um, just, you know, sort of lays it out in a way that helps people understand. And, you know, you've really in inspired me. In oh, that well, that was a great monologue you just gave. I mean, honestly, this, this last week alone, you know, we, we've gone from four years of Donald not getting in trouble for lying to Joe Biden getting in trouble for telling the truth in a speech in Warsaw. So yeah. that's where we're at. I, I call this yeah. period what the fuck fatigue, you know, where, <laughs> yes. where we have so many what the fucks that our outrage circuits are, are just burned out. This was supposed to be the great unclenching where, you know, the their vaccines are out there and, right. and Donald's gone and whatever part of us seized up on election night 2016, your your fists, your jaw, your sphincter, your shoulders, it's supposed to finally be relaxing now. But um. We still have a uh, PTSD, pandemic, Trump, shitstorm, dystopia. And uh, I have just nothing but praise for you because your voice has helped a lot of people pretend to be sane. Uh, well, which is fascinating because I'm not entirely sure how sane I am anymore. But uh, yeah, it's been a long five years, five decades, five centuries, five millennia. It's really hard to tell. Uh, but, you know, as for the eight, the great unclenching that never was, um, I think that's part of what what we uh, are facing now. Um, I've said this before, uh, what kind of demoralizes us or at least makes us exhausted, you know, we as empathetic human beings, like really en energizes the right. And it's it's a it's as if they've figured out that it's another tactic uh, to use against us um, because, Empathy, you mean? Uh, no, just an onslaught oh, yeah. of horrible things that, yeah. yes, are, are harder for us because we care. I didn't even mention what's happening with all the anti-gay, anti-trans 
uh, bills. I didn't even mention book yeah. burning and book banning. Yeah. I mean, in debating, there's this term called gish gallop, which is where, and Mitt Romney did this very effectively on Barack Obama in their first debate in 2012 in Colorado, where you unload so much bullshit on yep. your opponent that while your opponent is is deconstructing and explaining lie number one, you've moved on to lie number 40. And that's why Barack Obama was truly unsettled by Romney in their first debate. It, it, yeah. and it works too. I mean, it works. Like we'll, we'll be saying, oh, well, here's the facts. Here's what the constitution says. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what actually happened. And they don't care. They're here to get the sound by drop it and leave. I've never quite understood though why um, we haven't been able to find a corollary for that or an antidote for that on the left. I mean, with it always has seemed that the right is better at co-opting language than we are, yeah. but we're also at a point uh, in American history where it, you know, nuance doesn't matter anymore. The truth of the matter is this, in 2022 or 2024, you're voting for democracy or you're voting against it. Yes, like, correct. Why if is it? Vote, yeah. Right. Why is it so fucking hard to get people to understand that considering I, I know it's tenuous and the margins are slim and sometimes the margins are unexist are non-existent because of people like Cinema and Mansion. But, you know, we do theoretically have control of two branches of government. Why is it so difficult? Well, I mean, voter apathy, voter apathy is fascism's lube. And, uh, you know, it, it, the, the real challenge is, are we going to get people to show up to vote? And how will you get people to show up to vote? You know, uh, Joe Biden had more votes than any candidate that has ever run for any office in American history. Right. And Donald gets a lot of credit for that. A lot of folks were voting against him. So, you know, sometimes it's easier to get people to vote against something than for it. And uh, that's why it, you know, and we were used to presidents always getting shellacked in their first midterms of their first term, unless there's been a terrorist attack that took down the World Trade Center. So um, there's a lot of premature obituaries being written already. And I think yeah. the burden is on the Democratic Party to give people a reason to want to get off their couch and vote. And I'll tell you, if this Supreme Court winds up being the dog that caught the truck and they ban women's reproductive rights, before the midterms, you're going to see the greatest voter turnout we've ever had because 77% of us do support women's reproductive freedoms. We don't want to see it criminalized. Uh, I, I do think the Democrats, a lot of them are still walking around in clown shoes on this issue. They're using the wrong language. They're playing defense all the time. And, you know, not putting women in jail for something the Bible's not against that has been legal for 50 years, that has 77% approval, it's a pretty solid point. And so I, I think that there's a lot of things that this administration could do to try to get people turned on to vote, but we can get to that later. Yeah, uh, because it's part of part of it is 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 motivating voters around um issues that are being created by the other side. I mean, I you know, thus far. Um, the Supreme Court under John Roberts has been savvy enough not to go straight at Roe um, or Dobbs. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that's true anymore because I think people like, with the addition of people like Gorsuch, Coney Barrett, and Kavanaugh, um, they, they're just sensing their raw power. I mean, we've seen that with their shadow dockets and their their egregious uh, decisions, turning women into second-class citizens and yeah. on and on, uh, you know, against voting rights. Um, but in terms of what Democrats can do proactively, in terms of you know what they have control of, which is helping the people who voted for them, it seems that that hasn't you know they haven't done a great job of that either. And it, it seems once again we're in the situation where um, every four years uh, Democrats say, "Hey, black people, vote for us," and you know we'll get to you eventually. You know, just keep putting us in power. I, I kind of feel like they've actually done a bit better than that. I mean, I, okay. I do, you know, you look at how with the child tax credit, how they cut childhood poverty in this country by 50%. And then Joe Manchin, our actual president killed that. Uh, you look at how we're arguably on the other side of COVID. You look at how deeply the unemployment rate has dropped in just a year and a half. You look at how really strong on many levels this economy is mm -hmm. and you know, how he has, 
brought about, and I give Biden and, and Tony Blinken credit for this, they've brought about uh, the greatest international solidarity I've ever seen in mm -hmm. reinforcing NATO and making it stronger. I mean, last year, the deficit dropped for the first time since 2015 by 360 billion. The Democrats problem isn't that they aren't fighting for non-millionaires and it's not that they aren't doing things for non-millionaires. That's that their messaging always sucks. Always. Yeah. Sucks. Yeah, and I I completely agree with you that that this administration has accomplished more than I don't the last four combined perhaps in some ways, uh certainly in terms of the economy. Um I I do think though that there are opportunities uh, where they're not going far enough. And I think it is important to make the distinction between the administration and uh, the Congress, because right. it's not Joe Biden's fault that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are traitors to their party and to their country. It's not, I mean, what can he possibly do? They're not I to their donors, Mary. They're monogamous, well, really obedient to their donors. That's right. And I was going to say, this is, you know, my my thought about this all along is that the DNC should just shoot the lock off, off its wallet and just write them a blank check. We yep. will pay you whatever you, you're be, getting paid to do the wrong thing. We will pay you to do the right thing. This is my plan. It's right? called bribe back better because yes. I believe we, the people can do a better job of buying off our public officials than corporations. I'm that kind of That's patient. Right. I think that we as citizens can bribe these shills much better than the private sector. Yeah. I think, and, and you're better at slogans too. <laughs> So that's the really got to start hiring some comedians to write some slogans. I'll tell you that. I mean, they got a couple of good people, but I mean, generally it's just, you know, it, it's the, the John Kerry punching bag syndrome and they just take yep. it and take it and take it. The democratic party is like one of those S and M slaves who forgets his safe word and <laughs> just keeps getting hobbled. I mean, it's just pinata time. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they should be more on the offensive, and they could be. Look, Joe yeah. Biden needs to come out now and say, I want to decriminalize weed at the federal level, but I need more Democrats to do that. Right. I want to do student loan debt forgiveness. Yep. you got to give me more Democrats. If we had more Democrats, and by the way, if D.C. and Guam and Virgin Islands were states, nobody would care that Mansion and Cinema are bought off. He's got to come out and say, look, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. Things are better now than they were when I took office. We still have a lot we want to do. But you got to give me more Democrats and give people a reason to want to get up off the couch. If Hillary Clinton had come out for student loan debt forgiveness and decriminalizing weed in 2016, think about the enthusiasm that would have been behind her campaign. Yeah, and I would add voting rights <laughs> for all Americans to that. I would add voting well. rights, but generally that's not a sexy enough topic. People who care about America and care about democracy, they're already voting. People who care about voting rights are already showing up. It's everybody else we got to get off the couch. Well, then I guess link the two things. If you guys vote, we will legalize marijuana and we will forgive your student loan debts. Something yeah. like that. You yeah. Know? Or, yeah. I mean, we'll do that now. And if you vote, we'll make sure that it doesn't get reversed or what have you. Um, but it is... Uh, it's I, I it's kind of shocking. I know I shouldn't be shocked. I should be on shocked. Um, maybe maybe the good thing is that it means I'm still human after all of this to the extent that that's possible. Um, but I think uh, the the cravenness of the media, the fact that either the media haven't learned any lessons or just don't give a shit. Um, has pulled me up a little bit short because they are are treating the Biden administration as if it's a normal administration that followed another normal administration, which is always going to put him at a disadvantage, right? Yeah. yeah. This administration is a tourniquet that followed a gushing wound. And people are angry oh, like that, that it's kind of messy. But that's what it was. Yeah. It was life saving. I would have loved to have, you know, had a Liz Warren or a Bernie Sanders come in there and restructure our whole economy and, mm -hmm. you know, bring some economic justice to the game. But uh, and I'm not even a Democrat. I just am forced to vote that way by the Republican Party, right. which is not the party of Lincoln. It's not even the party of Quail anymore. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that there's still a lot they can do and they have a few months and a good long summer to do it. Mm -hmm. I hope the strategy is there. But, you know, again, we we care about democracy and voting rights in a culture where more than half of us don't even care enough to vote in the first place. It is incredibly important 
but it ain't sexy. And the media, God bless them, uh, the, in a free society, you should have a liberal media. That is a media yeah. that challenges the status quo, that right. questions authority and fights for the little guy. We have we have progressive journalists, but the media is as liberal as the corporations that own it. Um, right. The media doesn't want to spend a lot of money giving paychecks to people who are calling for their taxes to be raised. You know, so uh, again, it's like there's liberal journalists, but the media is biased not towards any political party or ideology. They're biased towards clicks and ratings and eyeballs and that and and money and that is always the media's bias right. i'd like democrats get a bit smarter at playing that yeah and that does translate in this day and age to being biased towards the right it's just the way it is uh because the right is is as we've seen right. with the child tax credit and the uh taxing of what is it like 200 billionaires <laughs> you know 200 people uh cannot we can't raise their taxes even though the amount of money they make is obscene and nobody should be able to make that much money, that's more important than yeah. keeping three and a half, four million children out of poverty. Yeah. I mean, look, any culture that is decided it's going to allow billionaires and poverty is a culture that's not serious about lasting very long. And that's right. I just need to bring that message. And Teddy Roosevelt made the same message as a Republican 100 years ago. Our problem is not with the corporations. It is with the greed. And yeah. when you can see these jerk offs who can afford to send themselves into space for their own amusement. But I mean, literally 40 percent of American families are in this reality show called Food, Medicine, Rent, Pick Two. It shouldn't be that hard to speak to the outrage, especially because Republican part policies are very unpopular. I mean, we're not that divided as a country. Most of us want a paid family leave. The majority mm -hmm. of Americans believe the rich should be taxed more. The majority of Americans don't think you should go to jail for weed. The majority of Americans don't think that you should put women in prison for terminating a pregnancy. White people are, are divided, but generally speaking, we're not that divided. Just the media right. needs the clicks. They need the controversy. And so these voices get magnified. Yeah, and it goes down the line, uh, marriage equality, climate change, on and on. Uh, so it it has always been fascinating to me. And, you know, you you have are much better than I am about uh, at talking to people on the other side of things. Like, I just don't, I don't have the restraint <laughs> at this point. Um, so... I'm that good at it. I just, I just, you well, know, you do I, it at least. Well, yeah, but I only do it in front of an audience. You know, I, I just feel like don't debate right wing people in a vacuum right. because they're in a cult. Like, I, I have a couple of questions I'll ask just to save time. If I'm debating uh, a, a diehard supporter of your uncle, uh, I, I, I just start with uh, where was Barack Obama born? And that simple question, it, it's not a litmus test, it's a shortcut because mm -hmm. ask anyone right now. Where was Barack Obama born? And you will find out in a few seconds whether they value Donald's racism and lies more than the truth, because they are so they, they cling to it. They're right. like diehard Star Wars fans who still defend Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> they'll, they'll be like, well, I don't know where he's from. He claims he was born in America and I see no reason to doubt him. He, he, I don't know where he's from. It doesn't matter. It's, 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 they can't come out and say he was born in America. And Donald admitted it. On September sixteenth, right. two thousand sixteen, he was born here. But Mary, almost every night, I'll get callers on Sirius XM, and when they're a special kind of evil, I, I ask that question, and you mm -hmm. wouldn't know how much it terrifies our right wing loved ones. And so I find asking simple questions like like like, can you name one teaching of Jesus, yeah. one actual teaching of Jesus that the Republican Party and Donald Trump have fought for in the last thirty years? Yeah, I want to get to that in a second because uh, that's part of um, an issue on the right that um, I think allows them to get away with uh, enacting policies that actually hurt <laughs> everybody in their base pretty much, yeah. except yeah. the you know ultra rich. Um, but I I've thought for a long time that if if you're if you're a republic an elected official who wants to get on a show like Meet the Press, that at the very least host like Chuck Todd, and I know it's asking a lot because Chuck Todd's horrible, but you know, the first question should be, is, is Joe Biden the legitimate president of the United States? Right. And if the answer is no, cut their mic and move on. But I we agree. can't do that. Rough. 
The problem with that is that uh, we have a media culture that has traded information for access. A couple of years right. back, I used to do mornings on CNN. And one day, uh, for some reason, they let me ask a question of Mitt Romney's campaign advisor. Um, and uh, it led to this Etch-a-Sketch comment where he said, oh, I, I said, aren't you afraid that like he's gone too far to the right now to, to be able to compete in general? Oh, no, you shake an Etch-a-Sketch. By the time I got home, it was international news, and and like I was on the Daily Show, and I was getting calls from Europe, and it was huge. And the next day, I went to CNN, and a producer said to me, "Yeah, we'll never be able to book him again." That was how the producer felt. That now, because you asked a hard question, that guest will never come back. They care about the access. That's why Mick Mulvaney is getting a job at at, at CBS News, even though he defended blackmailing the president of Ukraine to force him to help. Donald cheat in the 2020 election. Oh, and that's, I mean, he helped hide uh, what was happening with uh, the administration's response to COVID and all that other stuff. I mean, he has as much blood on his hands as everybody else. And it's true yeah. that access journalism has, has become a horrible um, stain <laughs> on the profession, but also on the American people's ability to understand what's what's going on. You know, we talked earlier about the 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 media journalism should should have a particular bias, but it's not a right or left bias. It's neutral as to the fact have a bias towards democracy because a free and fair press can't exist outside of that. And yet, you know, we have we have people like Maggie Haberman and uh, even um, not uh, Woodward, you know, holding on to information that was yeah. vitally important and could have made a difference, holding on to it so they could write a book and make a buck. So they're the organizations, the very powerful organizations for which they work, aren't even holding them to any standards either. Yeah. And that's their job. Their job is satisfy the shareholders with higher ratings. Their job is bring a book publisher uh, tidbits that no one else knows so I can help sell a book. That's what got Mark Meadows in trouble. You know, let's not forget right. Mark Meadows got in all this trouble and then Donald turned on him. And that's why Mark Meadows had foolishly given binders full of smoking guns to the January 6th committee and then right. suddenly sued them after your uncle turned on him. But it was too late. They already had it. And all these revelations we've gotten have all, Ginny Thomas, all of that has come because Mark Meadows briefly cooperated. <laughs> what an idiot. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> how, how dare he follow the law? Um, I mean, clearly he, you know, he forgot what party he was in for a second. Um, but that's why I think it's really important that uh, I don't know if it's if it's Speaker Pelosi, but uh, they're trying to craft legislation that would prevent anybody who actually publishes a book or any and does anything else publicly from claiming privilege or um, anything else. Because if you know you published a book about a certain topic. You can't pretend that it's a secret. Yeah. I mean, that would be challenged in courts so much. I hope my child would live to see the results. Uh, it'll just get yeah. tied up forever. And listen, this is this is why um, the as as grateful as I am that there's a January 6th committee, uh, we need law enforcement institutions to be doing their actual job because they can put teeth into their subpoenas. Um, I agree. Right? And and that's why this the news about Alvin Bragg was so, I mean, that guy needs to be called to account for that. There has, he needs to be asked to explain, but nobody ever does. Cy Vance did it years ago, before your uncle ever got to the White House. Cy Vance right. had the same exact case, overinflating the worth and the occupancy of these buildings to try to jack up the price. And he chose not to prosecute Don Jr. and Ivanka around the same time he chose not to prosecute Harvey Weinstein, even though he had those right. tapes. You and know. around the same time, he chose to cash a very large donation from yeah. the Trump organization, I believe. So. There we go. That, I mean, this is how it works. And it's like, we're just here shouting, trying to be heard over all the din. And, and, and you know, but it, it it does matter. And the message has to get out. And the fact is, there's more of us than there are of them. Right. There are. There's more people who, I mean, I'll come back to it. More people showed up to vote for Joe Biden than have ever voted for any candidate in this country's history. So we got to keep on fighting. And it's a fight that never ends. When we are very, very old, 
we will still hopefully be be fighting for democracy, fighting for women's rights and children's rights and immigrants' rights and LGBTQ rights, fighting for the the least of our people, as Jesus said, uh, because the struggle never ends. We're just here to hold the baton for a while and pass it on. But there's 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 no end point to this. You either spend your life uh, fighting for decency and justice, or fighting for the powerful to stay powerful, or being apathetic and watching Kardashians, which is the same to me as fighting for the powerful to stay powerful. Yeah, it is because we, a lot of people don't understand and don't get me wrong. I'm not being, I don't mean to sound condescending. A lot of it is because, um, Republicans have rigged the system in such a way that people need to work three jobs. Uh, because they don't Democrats have health care. And Democrats have helped with that, too. Of course they have. But I also think that if, um, you know, imagine if the Democrats had a real majority, oh, yeah. what a difference would have been made. So, yes, both, you I know. They have an fdr size majority. My God, yeah. I mean, right. think about the progress. Think about the fact that we could have gotten what we voted for. And yes. that's what they've dropped the ball on. All of these things that Manchin's killing. Look, I get it. You're not going to get another Democrat in West Virginia. It's not Jay Rockefeller country anymore. But still, you know, you, you got they have to be bringing up the fact that this is the agenda people voted for. That's right. And we shouldn't have to care about West Virginia. And, and you know, that's the other thing about. No mansion should have to care about West Virginia, but he doesn't. No. He doesn't. He cares about being a fossil fuel gazillionaire. But that's the thing with and I'm going to lump him in with Republicans here because Republicans don't need to care um about helping their constituents and worry yeah. about getting real it's almost as if the the worse they are the more guaranteed they are to win and uh which brings me back to oh, yeah. the ways in which they so cynically use um what should be good humane uh concepts against people you know they they use i don't like to call them culture wars because that suggests that both sides have a point um but you know they use things like choice um they use things like anti-lgbtq legislation and religion christianity of course about which you know much more than i but they use it in such a perverted, cynical way that it, it, I don't know, it, it makes people think, it makes their voters think, their base think that, um, that being hateful is actually somehow being good and it's worth the sacrifice of your economic stability somehow. Yes. I agree with everything you just said. And, and the way they use religion is ghastly, but in fairness, the Republicans have been getting away with a perverse, false version of Christianity for all these years because the Democratic Party lets them. The Democratic yeah. Party does not challenge them on their abuse of Christianity. And you cannot use the Bible. I, here, here's what I say all the time. I, I, I say to my Trump loving loved ones, you know, tell me one teaching of Jesus. Yeah. The Gospels that, uh, that, that Donald Trump or the GOP have fought for. And they'll say, well, anti-abortion. Well, Jesus isn't against abortion. And they are shocked when I say this, but then you got to go through it. God says that uh, life begins with first breath in Genesis. God makes it very clear in Exodus. He values a woman's life more than a fetus's. God once aborted every pregnant woman on the planet with a flood one day because he felt like it. Yeah. Jesus never mentions abortion. Um, nope. But Jesus was deeply against the death penalty. He literally comes out against eye for an eye in the Sermon on the Mount. That's right. Uh, the problem is Jesus is way too liberal for most of his unauthorized fan clubs. So that's why they want to put the Ten Commandments on a, a courthouse wall, of which I believe Donald's broken all 10. I've mm -hmm. been through it. He's broken all 10. Yeah. Uh, they'll never put the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, never, because Jesus is way too liberal for his fan clubs. And, and you know, God gives Moses rather detailed abortion tips for pregnant, unfaithful wives in Book of Numbers, Chapter 5. Jesus' religion of Judaism is not against abortion. Abortions are legal and free in Israel. So you want to go ahead and fight to put women in jail for terminating pregnancies, go for it. But stop saying you're doing it because you're Christian. Because if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be following what Jesus lays down for individuals and nations in Matthew 25, you fight for the poor, you help the sick, you be kind to those in prison. Those were his big three. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
nonviolence, turn the other cheek. He lives by the sword, dies by the sword. Try and get your Republican loved ones to actually quote Jesus sometime, because all they have is the manger and the resurrection, and they skip the rest. The rest, they, yeah. have, a, they have the golden calf, and it's duct taped to a left behind book. And <laughs> you know, how furious it makes me that Democrats have seeded Christianity the way they've seeded patriotism and the flag to these fake Christian fascists. I don't believe in right. hating anybody, but they have to be called out for it. And they've got to be called out publicly. I mean, the way your your uncle was allowed to blaspheme, blaspheme and pretend he was Christian and everyone was too afraid to call him out for it. I'm not. I'm actually going to talk about what does Jesus actually say? Because most of these people really follow St. Paul or Leviticus. They don't really give a rat's ass about what this peaceful, radical, nonviolent revolutionary uh, this community organizer uh, right. who was anti death penalty, never anti gay, never mentioned abortion, never asked a leper for a copay. This long haired, <laughs> homeless, unarmed, Middle Eastern, Palestinian Jew. Sandal wearing. Yeah, sandal wearing. Yeah. That guy, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of thumping Bible thumpers with the Bible. That's the book I'm writing. That's what I do material about. Uh, yep. Because I, I'm just tired of seeing the religion of my parents used to prop up these unholy fascists. Yeah, and your parents would know Cheery because- shit, right? Cheery shit, but yeah. Right, what, your mom was a nun? My mother was a nun uh, with an order called Daughters of Wisdom. She went into the convent right after the prom um, and they sent her to Africa where she worked with uh, 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 lepers in a jungle hospital in Malawi. And uh, my dad was a Franciscan brother who taught history to Catholic boys in Brooklyn with the Jedi robes. And um, so I, I have a curious perspective because my parents both once took a vow of celibacy. Right. And then they met each other while they were in the clergy. And eventually after 10 years, my dad got my mom to quit. So because of religion, I'm not supposed to be here, but because of religion, I got to be here. So right. uh, I'm pretty comfortable with chaos and contradictions. <laughs> Well, as as we all have to be, and and I think that's something that uh, the right has easier because they don't they don't care about contradictions, and um, they no, use hypocrisy. chaos in sorry. It's hypocrisy for them. Yes, it's not about it, contradictions. right, and they use chaos uh, in a really cynical way. You know, they they use chaos in the way Donald uses chaos, just to change the subject, to cover over what's really going on underneath, to yeah. drive us crazy, you know. Oh, my and, God, Mary, thank God we passed this law and teachers can stop teaching gay sex to kindergartners. Oh, my God, my child came home with a lesson about how to apply lube. Thank God they've done something. It's all outrage. All they've yep. got is bullshit. Oh, yep. Joe Biden's coming to take your hamburgers. Remember that one? Yes. They're twinkled the Muppets. Oh, wait, no, that Mr. Potato Head's gender. Oh, no, Kamala Harris is forcing children in ICE detention centers to read her children's books. Every week, it's a different level of bullshit that's always disproven. But they have nothing to offer non-millionaires except outrage. I ask folks all the time, tell me what the Republican Party, tell me when they put non-millionaires first since Nixon and the earned income tax credit. Tell me when. Yeah, never. They, they can't do it. It's all no. about keeping you angry all the time. So you'll believe we're actually doing shit for you. Right. Meanwhile, you know, turning uh, women and people of color into second class citizens, uh, which is really all the, the only way they can stay in power. Uh, if they uh, are allowed to continue down this path of voter suppression and voter subversion, which which is very concerning, but sticking with them. Um, the, the cultural stuff for a second, because you're right, this is a policy-free party, um, oh, yeah. except for you know tax cuts for rich people. Um, but their, their, I don't want to say ability necessarily, but their, the way they use Christianity, that as you mentioned, it's, it makes, it somehow ties the Democrats' hands. Now, for me, um, I think, it, it shouldn't be allowed to stand in the sense that um, this is not a Christian country. This is not a country of any religion. We allegedly have a separation between church and state. So right. when Lindsey Graham started asking Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson about her faith, Dick Durbin should have said, that is not an admissible line of questioning. Move on. I would even go further. I would say separation of church and state is the conservative point of view because right. that's what the founders wanted. Right. But this is not a, con the, the Republicans are not conservatives anymore. No, they're not. Yeah. So that, that word also gets misused. So 
I agree. But there, there is a limit to to the separation of church and state um, sure. argument because so many people uh, do the the religious argument or uh, point of view really resonates with people, and I think Democrats are too afraid to challenge just the way they're too afraid to challenge uh, the Second Amendment insanity. You know, because they don't want to turn off Democrats who are religious or who are, you know, who who want gun rights or whatever, because they just don't seem to understand that there's a huge, there is a vast territory between where the Republicans are in religion and guns and True. the opposite end of the spectrum, which is no religion, no guns. And they just can't figure out how to do what you just did. Yeah. Why? I know they're walking around in clown shoes. I don't know. I think they they're terrified. They're afraid of too many focus groups. And the reality is just come out there and speak it plain and be brave and don't cower and don't patronize. And Republicans, even if they don't agree with you, will respect you. If Mitt Romney had come out and said, look, I know you don't like me and I know I'm stiff and I know I'm not your dream candidate, but God damn it, I'll fight for your shitty causes. They would have respected him more <laughs> and turned out higher for him. You know, I mean, children can smell BS and, and so can conservatives. And, you know, they've been lied to all the time. I mean, look, look at the issue of, of undocumented immigration. Right. Uh, or as I call it, the Christian refugees at our border. You know, Donald has hired undocumented immigrants in two different centuries yep. to avoid paying his to avoid paying American workers a living wage. That's right. That is not an opinion. Mm -hmm. That's just a fact. And going back to it was Polish workers who built Trump Tower and they were That's undocumented. Right. Yeah. And, and I always say, you know, I don't like there's no wall you can build at our border that's going to be big enough to hide the gigantic help wanted sign we have down there. I don't trust any politician of any party who talks about securing our border, doing something about these illegals, which is a racist slur. You, you'll never hear them call a white lawbreaker an illegal. You yep. will never hear them call a guy who cheats on his taxes or makes a U-turn an illegal. Uh, and, and I always say, like, if you want undocumented immigration to stop, then start locking up all the white people who do all the hiring. It's really simple. You can end this tomorrow. You don't need to build a wall. You just start throwing people in jail for having their yard workers, their nannies, their cooks, their kitchen workers start incarcerating them. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to stop crossing our border and our economy is going to collapse. That's right. Ronald Reagan was for open borders, his words. Ronald mm -hmm. Reagan was for amnesty. He gave amnesty, his words. No Democrats are, but the Democrats let themselves be a damn punching bag. If they came out and said, don't trust anyone, anyone who talks about this stuff and they don't want to do anything about the hiring, but it's a racket. And that's why we keep fighting and fighting and fighting over this. Like we're fighting over uh, abortion. And when we're very old, the same fights will still be going on because they don't want to talk about actually what's behind it. It's just useful. And in some cases, useful for both parties. It feels like we didn't um, get past um, the point of no return, by which I mean, there there is a uh, theoretical point at which we've made enough gains that even though you know we might regress on occasion, we will never go all the way back. We ne that never happened. We are we are about to lose everything in this country. I what, believe. What do you mean? What do you mean? I mean that in 2022 or 2024, the um, America may become an autocracy, and I don't know that it will ever be to the extent it's ever been a democracy. <laughs> will ever yeah. be a democracy again? For about um, 50 years, we've been a democracy since the mid 1960s, right? So we've well, had about 50 years of it. Yes and no. I mean, John Roberts has been doing his damnedest since the aughts to uh, turn back voting rights for a lot of people. And how, because of voter suppression bills, how many hundreds of thousands of people in very crucial states weren't allowed to vote? Um, but, but again, the Democrats talk about this, but it's Democrats talking about it. I don't see any commercials showing people who showed up to vote and were denied the vote. It's like it's when you see the footage of African-Americans waiting for seven hours, those pictures have a, a, a very powerful effect. We need to hear from the actual voters who were denied their right, right at the right. ballot. Uh, otherwise, people just zone. It's something only liberals care about. 
The liberals talk about it. We know it's important, but we have to actually show a face behind it, not just be a bunch of concerned Caucasians talking about it. And that's an area where the Democrats need to really pick up the ball and get people outraged at how they're being swindled in this matter, because it, it, it's true. It's just it's hard to get people to care sometimes. They have to really be outraged by something like a millionaire slapping another millionaire on an award show. Well, that that has kept me up. I'm nice. sorry. I hope you, I hope you I, okay. I, I really wish you hadn't brought it up because I haven't quite processed it yet. And it really clearly needs more processing. I want to point out one thing. You and I both think we saw Chris Rock get slapped by Will Smith, but Merrick Garland's going to need about 18 months to review it before he can get back to us on what actually happened. We're, we're going to have to wait on that. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's on videotape or anything. This and is how it is in America. It always has to get worse before it gets better. And then it gets better, and then everyone goes back to sleep, and then the fascism comes back, and we get angry, and we have to do it again. I've, when it, in, in my lifetime, I've never seen a Democrat get elected president unless a Republican fucked everything up first. Right. I mean, Al Gore came close. Al Gore actually, the people picked Al Gore to be president. The people yep. picked Hillary Clinton to be president. That's right. But in my life, Jimmy Carter was in there because of Watergate. Bill Clinton mm -hmm. got in because trickle down finally collapsed. That's right. Barack Obama got in because George W. Bush, who is still the worst president of my lifetime, even Ooh. worse than Trump. Oh, yeah. I, I, if you count Iraqi people as people. I do count Iraqi people as people. And in, in terms of loss of life, I think they're pretty close. Mm -hmm. You count COVID as killing people. but Yeah, but, there, you know, it depends. I mean, we'll never know how many people actually died in Iraq. And Dick Cheney you know, gave us former company 40 billion of our tax dollars. I mean, I True. It's amazing. like the worst thing Donald Trump did was make Bush look not that bad. Because <laughs> I mean, well, seriously, <laughs> maybe I not the worst thing he did. But yes, let's don't get me wrong. I George W. Bush should have been in leg irons in front of the Hague. Uh, he and Dick Cheney are war criminals. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you. I it so it's not it just, and also they had eight years. I think if, if Donald, God forbid, had gotten another four, then yes, he would have definitely been giving W a run for his money. But I think Donald's, the, the damage Donald did outside of the loss of human life, which I don't at all mean to minimize because what was done right. in Iraq was just right. the right. fact that there's been no uh, accountability for that is, is crushing. Not um, a million deaths, a million confirmed American deaths this week. So, you know, whether it's Iraq or COVID, I mean, these these are people who, the, this is a party, the leaders of whom time and time and time again, get away literally with murder and uh, they lose Americans' jobs. They they kidnap and place children in concentration camps. They, which, by the way, is torture for both the child and the parent. I, I was not, when my daughter was like, four or five, there was about a six hour period of time. She was with somebody, you know, I thought I trusted, but there was no contact because a phone battery died or whatever. That was six hours of torture because I didn't know where she was. And, that, and there's still over 500 children. That's right. And the administration never, ever had any system in place. Nope. To reunite these children with their parents. There's still 500 kids. We're going to be hearing about this for years as these kids get older and begin, you know, trying to be like the movie Lion and use Google Earth to find where their old home is. I mean, but we've already forgotten that whole story because of what the fuck fatigue. We're so right. burned out in our outrage circuits that like can't even retain all this malfeasance and corruption. And so it's like it, it's really a drag to be this deep into it. In a way, I, I guess we should thank Will Smith for slapping COVID and Russia off the headlines for 24 hours. But, you know, this is the thing. Are, are you going to be apathetic and watch Kardashians or are you going to get in the game and actually care? And that's why we all have to take mental health breaks. We all have to be able to step away, mm -hmm. turn this off, go dance or paint or have sex or see a film or read a book. People have to be able to keep themselves sane because I think apathy is privilege at this point in our in our culture. I agree with you. And that's, that's um, been one of your taglines. Uh, in, in what I think you're opening, um, for what was once, uh, yeah, Saturday cast yeah. is just brilliant. And maybe you'll do it for us later. Uh, I think it was, uh, uh, depression is a disease. Negativity is a habit. Sanity is the opposite of vanity. And if we're all in this together, then, um, despair is privilege. 
you right. don't get to, you can be down, but you got to go process, take care, be good to yourself and then get back in the game. We all have to try to get 10 people to promise they'll get 10 people to show up and vote. Yeah. And the only, it, it, it's not exactly pushback. It's just context. I think um, we had five years, like my lockdown, my personal lockdown started in November, 2016. Um, so for a lot of us, you know, that first two years of Donald's administration was, was quite difficult to deal with, but again, still no excuses, you know, uh, no excuses. COVID on the other hand, um, I think functioned differently. It really did, um, create a serious mental health situation right. where I think it's not as simple as saying, come on guys, you know, let's you can't be apathetic because so many people are hurting yeah. in a way that isn't being addressed. And it's right. again, it's just another one of those things. Who's talking about that? Nobody's talking about that because, you know, we, we were all to one degree or another affected and it's sort of like, well, you know, we just have to move on, but we, not everybody can. Um, oh, and the, you know, that, some of us never will. Some of us will never have the opportunity to. And a lot of that is because of the the, the onslaught of things we've been talking about. So you're right. You're so right. How do we simplify it? How do we uh, isolate or identify the things that that are most, if not maybe most important, but most resonant that are most actionable for people? Uh, because again, I think part of the problem, it isn't for a lot of people, it's not so much apathy as uncertainty about what to do, and over, a, a sense yeah. that what they, that nothing they could do will matter. Well, I mean, every one of us have our own, you know, important issues that matter to us. I mean, go to any kind of, you know, liberal demonstration, go to an anti-war protest and you'll see, oh, there's the hemp people. There's the abortion people. There's the LGBT people. And go to any conservative protest. Oh, there's the gun nuts, and there's the put women in jail for abortion people, and there's the anti-gay people, there's the racist people. You know, um, it's all about big umbrellas, and and it's very easy to get overwhelmed. It's very easy to to just feel like it's all too big and want to give up. Uh, but you know, I, I honestly think it's different for everyone. What matters is, you know, it doesn't matter how tight your sound bites can be. I mean, for me, I, I like doing stand up about politics because Billy Wilder. Um, once said, uh, if you're going to tell people the truth, make it funny or they'll kill you <laughs> do it. If you know, you'll, you'll get so far with the truth, but you'll get a little farther with the truth and a dick joke, you know? And so for me, that's, that's always been, um, my guiding light. George Carlin changed my life. I mean, the first time I saw George Carlin live, he changed my life. I wish he were still around. So do I, but there's a lot of great comics doing really good there work with you, and it's hard for them to get on TV sometimes doing politics because click, click, click. Yep. Uh, but but I think what matters is democracy, as you said. I mean, look, I, I think the square root of all of our problems is private money and elections. How sexy is that? But I mean, privately funded elections is why we're fucked up. It's the square root of not having health care, the square root of not having uh, of having all this poverty. I mean, you know, publicly funded elections would begin to make it a bit harder to buy governments, uh, but you know it, it's a hard sell. So it's like, find the issues you care about. If there's an issue that you're not sure about, take some time, educate yourself, get your talking points. You know, Most of us don't spend our entire lives debating these things with other people unless we want to. But I mean, if you wanna make a difference, help on the local level. I, I, I will always say it, You know, what happens in your state and local elections affects your life so much more than whoever the president is. And-, and yeah. You know, I mean, you can go and volunteer uh, at your local Democratic Party office for Congress or Green Party, whatever party you want. I mean, just get engaged. It's great to sit around and gripe. And, you know, I mean, they used to march for protests. Now it's send. Yeah. Uh, but just just, you know, it's good to care. It's good to have empathy in every generation. The mean people always find a way to mock you for caring. When I was a kid, it was uh, bleeding hard liberals. Well, you mean like, yeah, like Jesus? Yeah. Or then it was, uh, then it was politically correct. And I always thought politically correct was being less dickish, yes. like using language to avoid yes. being a dick to people. Yeah. Let's, why not? Let's be nice. Trigger warnings. Like somehow that makes us assholes. 
that social we don't want to trigger warrior. people. Right. Social justice warrior happened in the Obama years. And right. Like, now it's woke. Oh. Yeah. Now it's woke. And, you know, woke used to be a word that anti-racists used to, uh, you know, say they don't want to be racist. Mm -hmm. Now woke is a word that racists use to smear anti-racists. I mean, woke has just gone from being, you know, an aspirational term to a slur in just about two years. I don't know anybody who's not a fascist who uses the word woke anymore. But it's all, all, and snowflake as well. Right. All of it is just like, how can you have contempt and dehumanize people who care, who have empathy, who are sympathetic? Imagine what they would call Jesus if he showed up today. And by the way, to atheist friends, I talk about Jesus, but it's like atheists can use this shit against the Christians as well. I, mm -hmm. The fake Christians. I find most atheists I meet know the Bible better than most evangelicals I meet. I, I meet. So you don't have to believe in the Bible to, right. to, to use it against these people because the Bible is their spiritual camouflage. It's how right. they, their, their actual religion is criminalizing abortion, mm -hmm. and pretending they're better people than others. That's and right. They have to have that camouflage taken away. Yeah. And it, it, it it's kind of part and parcel of um, how white supremacy functions. Uh, oh, yeah. My life or Republicans, the Republican Party, again, doesn't really care if their base is poor and uneducated and it doesn't have health care, uh, as long as they give them the message that because they're white, they're better than. Um, you know, it's not about it's not about how how much better you're doing. It's about how much worse other people are doing than you. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, I'm an atheist, and I I've read the Bible more than any any of these people. Right. Would be I my know. Guess. Some of the best Christians I know are yeah. atheists, and some of the most yeah. godly heathens I know are Christians. And that's one of the things, and I know this isn't new. Um, you know, it's it's a long it's not even a trend, it's just sort of a, a a an article of faith among Republicans that you know you need to be mean and um mock people for uh wanting to be kind to others, <laughs> but uh that's that was the first thing I thought uh, when Donald started gaining his uh, campaign started gaining traction, it's like we are going, we are going to see in a way we haven't before what happens when the person in charge believes that kindness is weakness and cruelty yeah. is strength. Exactly. And it just, you know, it, it, it felt like that grew exponentially and uh, the, the, wow. the disease of cruelty metastasized. Yeah. And, you know, we have to figure out a way. You said this earlier. They're, they're creating these horrific don't say gay bills be, and making it sad. And this is this has happened forever that, you know, gay homosexuality is always sexualized always. in a way that that heterosexuality isn't you know if if yeah. you're a straight couple you know your mom and dad uh if you're a gay couple it's all about the sex yeah. so you know they're making it seem like these children are being indoctrinated but the truth of the matter is they they're putting these children in a position where they're they can't even talk about their their two moms or their two dads and well teachers can't I mean, teachers can't because the whole thing has taken a page out of these godforsaken abortion laws in uh, Florida, in, in Texas, and now in Missouri, where mm -hmm. where the most insidious thing about don't say the don't say gay bill, and it is fair to call it that, by the way, um, mm -hmm. is that it essentially deputizes insane douchebags yes. to file lawsuits against school districts if your if your child's teacher says something that you don't think is appropriate. There is a pathway, even if your child is grades four through 12, to sue the school district and force your fellow citizens, taxpayers, to pay the bill for your grievance. And that's what was so insidious about these abortion bills. It's going right. to, I mean, in Idaho, with this new bill, if a woman is raped and chooses to terminate the pregnancy and not carry her rapist child to term, the rapist's entire family can sue the uncles and every uncle and aunt of the rapist can sue the victim for 20 grand a piece. Now, I mean, like, and that's exactly what the Don't Say Gay Bill does. Mm -hmm. it, it's horrifying. And it's the sort of thing where it might just have to be put into practice for people to realize how sinister it is. Yeah, and I, I think we are at that point. Um, and yet it's sometimes it, it just seems like it should be so simple. Now, I know Donald doesn't understand this because he did grow up in a family without kindness. But for the rest of us, um, even people on, on, even Republicans, do you, would 
any parent really want their child to grow up without any kindness? Like it, it, the insanity of that yeah. is mind boggling. And it does lead to these dr dr draconian, punitive, uh, you know, the, the bill in, I'm sorry, not, you just mentioned, I forgot the state. Um, oh, there's a bunch of them. Idaho. Is it Idaho? Missouri's is terrible Missouri, as well. Sorry. Yeah. The, the state where the rapist family can sue. That's, that's Idaho. Missouri Idaho. can sue you if you leave the state to have an right. abortion. Right. So now you're trapped. Yeah, exactly. Like Missouri is its own country now, apparently. Yeah, these I mean, are the small the, government people, Mary. These are the small government people who want right. the state to have the power to force a woman to carry her rapist child. I mean, that's just, you know, I, we need to call, that's a pro-rape law, by the way. It encourages rape. Like They are they are giving rapists the chance to pick out the mother of their next child. And and have everybody in their family sue that person and make a buck. I, I mean, it's it's the hypocrisy. Don't say gay. Think about all the teachers. Think about all the teachers in Florida who are going to be so terrified. I'm not, and I'm talking four through 12. Because what what who's talking about these issues, you know, in 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 kindergarten through third? It's all just to be mean for its own sake. Because right. again, they got nothing to offer these white people. They got nothing to offer these Christians. They got nothing to offer these non millionaires. So they got to get them outraged. And so if we're going to be mean to transgender children, mean to children of gay parents, well then that's going to give you the illusion that we're fighting for you. And that's it. And so teachers will be so scared. My God, you know, can I, you know, can I, if my student asks me about Justice Kennedy writing the majority opinion, legalizing marriage equality in this country, do I as a teacher want to take the risk of my entire district being sued by engaging with this kid? And then they go home and tell their parents that I relayed some facts. It's all designed for fear and intimidation. There's nothing Christian about it. There's nothing American about it. They despise freedom. They look at how they treat trans children. They despise liberty. They talk a good game, but they actually despise freedom and liberty. For everybody else, it's true. And and in your in your discussing these specific laws and in, in these specific states and and the fallout that we're going to see from them it just reminds me how comprehensive the agenda is because we're talking about history we're talking about critical race theory again something that's not taught in K through 12 schools last I checked no. and that the opponents of it don't even know how to define it would be my well, guess opponents are fans of uncritical of racism theory these are the people who that's right. were one they were more offended by Colin Kaepernick's knee than Derek Chauvin's and if you don't believe me check their twitter profiles much more offended by Cap's knee than by Chauvin's yeah you know? and you're and this is this is Donald look at the people and every one of us has these people in our lives and our families and our Facebook circle who are more angry, more angry at protests against racism and police brutality than they are at racism and police brutality. That's right. That's right. And, you know, and, and we think about how little it took to get Colin Kaepernick sidelined and how much it took to get the sled. And I don't like to call it justice because. George Floyd is dead. George Floyd was murdered. His family will never see him again. There's no justice for that, but I guess accountability maybe uh, to get the slightest bit of accountability to get uh, Derek Chauvin uh, convicted. I, I mean, look Kaepernick, at how much it took. If Kaepernick had smacked his wife around, he'd still be playing. <sighs> you know? Yes, I do. <laughs> And it's painful for me because I'm not a fan of football, but I, I am a fan of head injuries. So it's really awkward for me. Yeah. So how do, how do you, uh, you know, how do you, that's a tough one. Yeah. Tell me about it. Wow. Um, you know, but like, this is why I love that you're doing this show because you are taking your fame and fame is the silliest thing humans have ever invented. Yeah. I mean, next to, you know, napalm, uh, you are taking your fame and you are repurposing it for the greater good. You are using the notoriety of your last name to try to help people, to try to give people comfort, to try to uh, call out regressive, evil, toxic, hateful, hurtful bullshit. And and that's the, the noblest thing you can do. I mean, you're turning pain into gold. And that's what we can all do on, on, in our communities and our families. 
uh, and we all just have to remember, you know, you can you can be a nice person and still be cool, and you don't have to hate. I, I think when you when you let yourself hate right wing folks, you you become stupid. Hate makes you stupid, and as soon as you let yourself hate them, then you're doing what they do. You're dehumanizing right. them. You're 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 seeing them as less than a person, and when you hate someone suddenly everything you do against them is justified. You can lie about them and smear them and be cruel to them because look, these fucking fascists, they support Trump. Fuck these people. No, it, you, mm -hmm. you, I know it sucks. Being the good guy is a burden. But Hubert Humphrey, one of the best good guys we've had, uh, said, compassion is not weakness and concern for the less fortunate is not socialism. It's a lonely road to walk sometimes and it can feel really, really oppressive and scary and people don't show up at midterm elections and there's a lot of pain. But what are you going to do? You're going to check out and watch the Kardashians all day and not give a damn? Or are you going to stay in the fight, keep yourself sane, and try to make, at least today, a little more comforting and easier for somebody else? Yeah. Although you, you do seem quite focused on the Kardashians. Um, we'll have to talk about that some other time. Yeah, speaking of outrage, I can't let go of. I know. I got, I'm got. i sorry. I'm, I know. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought? Like, Kim is carrying Kanye. My God. Jesus. Yeah. But you're right. And, you know, I, I appreciate... Um, the kind words. And I, it is, you know, you know, this as well as anybody that it is hard to hang on to, um, your sense that, that hatred is, is the wrong way to go because there is a lot to be hateful about right now. I mean, it, you know, the thing we watched horrible things happening to people every day. And, um, that having been said though, I agree with we, the, Worst thing we can do is become like them. Yeah. I mean, because you know, then what's the point? Right. Yeah. But it I mean, doesn't. You're, you're a douchebag for the good side, you know? And, and one thing that the comedy has taught right. me, uh, and, that, and that George Carlin and Bill Hicks and some other people taught me is um, anger is not funny, but outrage, yeah. You know, anger will be toxic. Anger will kill you. Anger will make you look like the guy screaming in the mall wearing a trench coat. But, uh, outrage works and if yeah. you can tap into the outrage and manage your anger and i know that's hard twitter is just there with all these fucking racists and bots designed designed to get you angry at this point mary i, I anytime someone attacks me i check their account to see if they you know if the account's less than six months old if it began you know during the 2020 elections there's right. ways of realizing you know oh you, you know, maybe they, you can't spell your because you're a Trump supporter. Maybe you can't spell your because you're raised somewhere outside Moscow. But yeah. uh, these are bots and we can't let the haters get to us. It's really hard. It's really hard to be the nice person someday when you're fighting all this. But, you know, at least when you're old, you can you can realize I fought for other people. I fought for people I'll never meet. And I didn't forfeit my humanity in the process because hate will give right. you cancer. Yeah. And listen, you can be kind, but also have righteous anger. We should be angry, um, you know, and but in the context of realizing that a lot of what we're fighting um, is limited to a, a, a fairly small number of people. Um, a lot of the 74 million people who voted for Donald have been lied to across the board by everybody they voted for. Yeah. Right. All of them. All of them. I ask them every I say, I say, please give me one day of Trump's four years in office, what, 1,400 days, one day, month, day, year, where he did not lie to you. Just one. Try that one sometime. I mean, it, you know, and, and they can't do it. I mean, it's like it's like asking the Bible for a, 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 a teaching of Jesus yeah. that the GOP fights for. Um, I, I put together a, a hashtag that I did a couple times on Twitter um, called Ask a Trump Defender where I just put like 75 questions to just ask the people in your life, you know, mm -hmm. um, simple questions about every different scandal, just to ask people to see how well they'll figure it out. Because these folks, not all of them, but most of them are beyond reason that, you know, yeah. facts don't matter. The constitution, the Bible, reality doesn't matter. And, you know, it, in 1945, it took a lot of Germans to actually see Berlin destroyed Hitler killing himself and these bodies pulled from these death camps. Yeah. But they finally realized how bad they'd been suckered. Right. I mean, it took eight years with George W. Bush and Dick Cheney for people That's to right. realize how bad they'd been suckered. Yeah. And unfortunately, eight years for them to forget. So people were fighting for. I try to remind myself, like, you know, 
and I say this to conserv to right wing people. There aren't conservatives anymore. There's, uh, but I say like, I'm fighting for you harder than your party's fighting for you because That's right. I don't think you should ever have to do a GoFundMe to pay for your child's surgery. We deserve the same access to health care as all of our capitalist allies. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you uh, should have to worry about your loved ones being shot by a mentally ill person who was easily able to get an AR-15. Right. Uh, you know, I don't think you should be paying a higher percentage of your income in taxes than some jagoff billionaire who takes himself into space for fun. Like we are fighting so much harder for our right wing loved ones who hate us yep. than their own party. We're like the X-Men. You know, they they think we're monsters, but we're they think we're mutants. We're just more evolved, and we have to fight for the people who are afraid of us. Yeah, no, that's it. That's it sucks. It's exhausting, but yeah. like you said, there are more of us than there are of them, and we just have to treat this like a relay race. That's what it is. If we need to tap out, we need to tap out, but we need to understand that we all we have each other's backs, and um, that is so much easier to do. Uh, with people like you out there um, fighting the good fight. And I, I always like to end because, um, you know, we're talking about <laughs> very difficult things. This country is in a terrifying space. The world is, uh, you know, we are really um, on the brink in a lot of ways. So having yeah. said all of that, um, I'd like to know what gives you hope and how do you hang on to hope? my favorite question oh good um because i ask that all the time of my guests I, I ask what keeps you up at night and what gets you up in the morning um honestly it's that it's that young people uh have got it figured out so much better than than uh gen x or or or, or baby boomers um you know young people are growing up in a world where there's nothing wrong with being gay Young people now are growing up in a world where there's nothing wrong with being trans. Young people right. now, I mean, there's no one who's under 18 who has any, mem or under 21 who has any memory of 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, they haven't been fed all this hatred of Muslims, you right. know, that we had to live through all these times. I mean, we have to remember that for everything you show me how it's getting worse, I can show you five ways it's getting better. Yeah. And when I came to, when I, I moved to New York City when I was a teenager, uh, in the 80s, at the time of uh, the height of AIDS activism. And this is at a time when you could be fired from your job for being gay. People were terrified of AIDS. No one understood it. 20,000 Americans had to die before Ronald Reagan even said the name of the disease. And what I saw was gay people stop waiting for the government to give them their rights. Right. I saw gay people take to the streets and protest. I saw groups like ACT UP do protests that made little Catholic kids like me very uncomfortable in a way I needed to be made uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I saw their straight allies come out and risk abuse. I, I was a kid in high school who gay kids came out to me because I worked in theater and I, I knew gay people and, and I was very lucky in that sense. And I saw this incredible struggle and the result of it was the swiftest advancement for civil yeah. rights for any oppressed minority group in history. That's right. I mean, like, and, and gay people are the oppressed minority in every minority group. And mm -hmm. what I've seen in my little insignificant lifetime was the swiftest advancement of rights to go from, from, from not having your name said and living in fear to having the Supreme Court let you marry, having Barack Obama during his reelection campaign come out for marriage equality. Right. And it happened because of a plague and America helped lead. But in the moment, I didn't see that. I just saw all my right. friends were douchebags to gay people. Yeah. Now they would never admit they were, you know, just like racists won't admit they're racist. So, I mean, I'm lucky enough that I've seen what people can do if they care and come together and form coalitions, even if you don't agree on everything with people. And um, honestly, that's why it's, uh, it's fitting on Trans Visibility Day to say, you know, the LGBT struggle I've witnessed is why uh, I believe in the American dream. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think um, I we think we're contemporary. So I saw the same um, struggles. I mean, a little older, but I, I was right there, the height of it in the 80s. And um, if you had asked me 20 years ago, will there ever be marriage equality? I would have said never in my lifetime. Yeah. So it that is something that you know, that very ev swift evolution is something that should give everybody hope. Um, John, this was 
it's just incredible talking to you. I let, I could talk to you forever, but I think I should probably let you go. I'll, I'll bring more jokes next time. I won't be so happy next time. Uh, I, that's okay. Um, <laughs> funny, serious. I, I'm, I'm here for all of it. Uh, please let us know. Um, let people know where we can find you um, yeah. on Twitter. Tell uh, us about your show. Twitter at John Fugelsang, but you have to be able to spell my last name. I apologize for that. Sirius XM, uh, Progress, Channel 127, five nights a week. We're at what the fuck o'clock to holy shit, it's late. Uh, <laughs> listen to us on the app or on Sirius XM On Demand. And as of this week, we are finally uh, doing a daily podcast, the John Fugelsang podcast on Stitcher, on, on Google, on Apple, wherever you get your pods. Um, Sirius XM finally, after all these years, has agreed to let us do a uh, like a 30 minute version of last night's radio show. So, you know, my show's had everybody from Tyler Perry to Julie Andrews, Bernie Sanders to Chris Christie. Uh, we have celebrities and, and politicians and activists and authors. Ken Burns is on tomorrow night. Oh, uh, cool. Richard Linklater's on next week. We get movie stars and rappers. And, and uh, so um, you can now hear that uh, every day because a, a, less of me is much better. So, Mary, I thank you. I'm going to get you to come on the show next week and uh, get all your listeners to uh, to come over and check it out. And I, I love that you're doing this. Anytime I can be of service to you, please let me know. Thank you, John. This is fantastic. You're fantastic. Everybody check out the show and uh, we'll talk soon. Hopefully coming uh, back on the road to a town near you guys soon. Hopefully. All right. Fantastic. Peace. Bye. Bye. That was awesome. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, now I'm going to answer some of your questions. So first up uh, from Lucia. In 2020, I was waging a fight every day for the election. We need to take this election seriously. The 72-year-old educated Arizona woman wants the help from home. Is there a best practice for converting Republicans or those who don't vote? My advice, focus on people who don't vote. Uh, and anybody who voted for Donald in both 2016 and 2020, I don't, I don't think it's worth wasting your time. So focus on people who either never voted or are lapsed voters. Uh, from Mary in Canada, are the midterms in 2024 our last chance to save the free world? Uh, yeah, I, I think that if uh, the Democrats lose either the House and or Senate in 2022, that increases the difficulty of our um, holding on in 2024 which is why, you know, uh, we're all talking about it so much, uh, how to get people motivated, how to get people to understand what's at stake. Um, so the best thing we can do is vote, register other people to vote, talk other people to voting, drive people to the polls, whatever we, whatever else we can do. Uh, let's see. From Rick, first of all, shouldn't uh, Clarence Thomas recuse himself? Secondly, what the fuck? His wife is paying for buses to an insurrection. How is this a thing? Um, yeah, how is it a thing? I, I have heard people call for his recusals. It's not enough. He needs to be called on to resign. If he doesn't resign, he should be impeached. He will never be removed from office with the uh, number of Republicans in the Senate, but he does need to be held to account. As, as most of you probably know, there there is no ethics entity uh, governing the Supreme Court. Supreme Court justices are entirely uh, in charge of whether or not they recuse themselves from cases, even if those cases involve their own spouse. So we cannot hope for any sense of decency from Clarence Thomas, not that we ever have been able to. Uh, from Kathy in Des Moines, Iowa, I'm worried about the election this year. If the Republicans take over the House and Senate, Joe Biden's agenda will stop. If that happens, his chances for re-election decrease. What action should the Dems take to get us fired up? Just mentioned that. We need to make people understand what's at stake. We need to help people understand how their lives will be worse if Republicans get back in charge and how the Democrats, especially uh, President Biden and his administration, are making things better. Um, and that's that's what needs to be hammered home every single day between now and 2020 to November 2022. 
So I'm going to wrap up now. Um, but along those lines, I just wanted to announce that starting next Tuesday, I think it's April 5th, but because of COVID, my sense of time is still really terrible. Next Tuesday, April 5th, we're adding an, an additional live stream, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And it's going to be called the strategy session. So every Tuesday, I'm going to have two or three guests, all of whom will be speaking to specific issues regarding the upcoming midterm elections. What's at stake? What can we do? What can we, how can we uh, impress upon elected Democrats? Uh, what needs to be done? And it is, it is um, a way to help people, one, get motivated and two, feel empowered. So I hope you will join us for that very first show next Tuesday, April 5th at 7 p.m. And then next Thursday, of course, we will have our usual one-on-one -on -one interview. Uh, and if you have any questions, please, you can send me an email at mary to mary at politicon.com. And um, I will get to as many of your questions as, as I can. So remember, from now on, it's a live show on YouTube Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, Thursdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. You can search for it on the Politicon YouTube channel uh, or check for the link in the show notes and be sure to follow, like the episode and ring on the bell because that, that way you will be sure to receive updates every time a new episode drops. And again, send your questions to me, mary at politicon.com. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can also follow us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, except Spotify. We're not on Spotify anymore. Uh, and give us a five-star review because it really, really does help um, other people find the show. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much to my incredible guest, John Fugelsang. And I will see all of you on Tuesday. Stay safe.